You know, I, I love being in churches where you can, you can tell when people are singing with the breath of Almighty God coming out of them. You can just, you can just tell it in the air. I've been in churches before, man, I'm, I'm going to make some mid-axe people mad because they don't like feelings and stuff like that. They, they think the way you show your spirituals by acting like a, a dead statue but I've been in some churches, man, where the breath of Almighty God knock you down when you walk in the back door. Yeah. You hear a church sitting there singing them hymns, man, you can just, you can just, you can just smell the Spirit of God in the room. And I've been in some churches where it just smelt like death. Yeah. You know. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. You know. <laughs> Amen. Man, I'm telling you, when the Spirit of God's in that heart, boy, those hymns, those hymns mean something. Sometimes, Bill, I sing them in the shower. Arise, my soul, arise. You know, I, I sing them, man. I rip them. I can't sing. I sound pretty good in the shower with all that echo bouncing off. But I tell you what, I tell you what, by the time, by, after about five minutes singing in the shower, Bill, I'm in there crying and shouting and, and just, my goodness, man, lift up your voice. Sing unto him. I mean, the the. I mean, just look at the music the world makes. Amen. I kiss the girl and all this junk the world puts out, and Christians act like it's going to kill them to stand up and sing a song to the Lord, who loved them and gave Himself for them. Man, you. But I can I can tell it in this church, man. I can tell it. There's true joy, true understanding. In singing those hymns. Every, every time we come across a verse in one of them hymns and talk about Christ coming to take us home, yeah. boy, you see Bill Keener's hand go up in the air. Yeah. Hey, Amen. That's, that's, a, that's a hope, ain't it, Bill? That's a hope. I'm, I mean, I, listen, man, I'm not in no hurry. I'm not in no hurry for the rapture. I want God to take his sweet time because once his long suffering is over, it's over. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to sit down here and, and suffer until the Lord tells me it's time not to suffer anymore. Right. The suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared. The sufferings of this present time does not affect my hope of glory out there in the future. Right. And so I'm, I'm not worried about this present time. We endure it. We partake in it. And let the Lord come when he's ready to come. But when he comes... It sure is going to be a day, man. Light affliction. I can't wait to see him all with you. We're all going to get the same for the first time together when we go up to rapture. Amen. I mean, if you don't want to have a good time, stay away from me. That's all I'm saying. Because I'll, I'll ruin it for you. I'll, yeah, Lane. Lane, <laughs> Lane, don't, Lane ain't going to have a good time, is he? All right, Ephesians chapter one. Let's get started here. His backpack has to go. Check it out. <laughs> yeah, he ain't gonna get off the ground. All that stuff in his backpack. <laughs> Lord ain't gonna be able to pick him up. <laughs> we love you, man. <laughs> he's probably got he's probably got laundry detergent in that backpack. To be honest about it. <laughs> All right, Ephesians chapter one. Last last week we laid out we laid out the doctrinal outline of the of the first section here, Ephesians one three through three twenty one. I don't think I'm going to draw it back on the board this morning, but what we looked at is the the from from verse three in Ephesians one down to verse fourteen is Paul laying out for us the purpose of God concerning the mystery of His will. You were called into God's eternal purpose. You were called for a purpose. And God has now made known in this dispensation the mystery of his will of which we've been called into. And so it's important if we're going to walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing and all these things, we have to understand the purpose for which we were called. And we were called according to a purpose that God chose us for before the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. The second part is from Ephesians 1, 15 down to verse 23, where Paul prays for our inner man, our, 
or spiritual enlightenment or the wisdom of revelation and not and 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 understanding in this knowledge, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So Paul lays out the purpose of God concerning the mystery of his will and our calling into it. And then his prayer is for our inner man to be enlightened to understand these things. In chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 22, Paul shows us that we are the objects of this eternal purpose of God. What a, what a blessing, man. What a blessing that an old dead sinner... A dead Gentile dog like me, a dead sinner, was, was part of God's purpose before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Only God could do that. Mm -hmm. Only God could take something as insignificant as me and use me to fulfill a purpose he gave, gave me in Jesus Christ before the world even began. Yeah. This is, guys, this, this information in Ephesians is mind-blowing. It just is. It's mind-blowing. Right? God has this purpose and he took me who was dead, raised me or quickened me, raised me and seated me in the heavenly places. Right? Took, took me as a Gentile who was, a, who was uncircumcised and an alien and a stranger and made me a part of his household. Made me an heir with the, with the saints. Made me a joint heir. Amen? A fellow heir with the with, 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 with the, the, the saints of God and made me a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now Paul in chapter 3, just like chapter 1 laid out the purpose of God, chapter 3 lays out the dispensation of God. Chapter 1, Paul talks about the purpose of God concerning the mystery of his will and how we are the objects of this purpose in chapter 2. Chapter 3, he says, for this cause. Paul received the dispensation of God to make known this mystery in the world. Amen. Meaning, you Gentiles that have been called into the purpose of God can only be educated as to why you were put in Jesus Christ through the dispensation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Amen. Most Christians today suffer from, what, what shall we say, an identity crisis. Not understanding why they were called into Christ, the purpose for which they were called into Christ. And so they just run around trying to fulfill Israel's purpose. And you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were given a purpose in Christ before the world even began. Amen. And God kept that purpose hid until, until he made it known through his dispensation given to Paul to make known this mystery of his will. And so, and so you have the purpose of God, Paul's prayer for our understanding. You have, you have Paul telling us that we are the objects of this purpose. Us dead Gentiles have been called and are the objects of this purpose of God. And then in chapter 3, he shows us the dispensation of God given to make known this mystery among us. And the prayer of Paul there is for the inner man to be strengthened. Right? And so we, we looked at some stuff last week that shows that, that we're really dealing here with the heart, with the mind and heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order for us to function in the body of Christ the way God has called us to function, there first has to be a renewing of the mind to understand the mystery of God's will, what you've been called into, and then the way you're going to walk worthy of that is to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. You get the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. And that's what Ephesians talks about. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love and all that. And so we'll get to all that. But that's just a basic outline of the first three chapters. And so this morning we're going to begin looking at this first section. I'll draw it up, write it up here. The first section we're going to look at is Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and it deals with the purpose of God. The purpose of God. I mean, if you read, if you read those 14 verses, man, they're rich. Right? I mean, you, you get more about the will of God in those 14 verses than, than you'll, you'll ever get anywhere else. Those 14 verses deals with... Uh, Look there, look there in 1-5. How, 
having predestinated us to the adoption of children according to the good pleasure of his what? Will. Look at, look at 1 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to what? The good pleasure. What does he say? According to the. Which he hath purposed in himself. You're being taught here what God purposed in himself. You don't have to guess anymore. Did Paul just say God made known the mystery of his will? Then you don't have to guess anymore. And so this, what, what we're being taught here, do you know who you are today? If you haven't figured this out, guys, you know, you know what you were predestinated for? Adoption. You're the family of God. You're his sons and heirs. And as sons and heirs, guess what God wants you to have? He wants you to have the mind of Christ and an understanding of his purpose and his will. How can a son function in the house with the father as an heir if he don't know what the father wants? And so this information here, don't talk to me about walking worthy when you're ignorant of this information. Amen. People want to bypass everything. Sure. Well, I'm just as dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to understanding the mind of the Lord, but I'm going to do my best anyway. You're going to make a mess. My people perish for lack of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. If any man glories, let him glory in this, that he knows and understands me. Your glory is knowing and understanding the mind of the Father. That's your glory. You know what it is? It's Christ in you. The hope of glory. The purpose of God concerning the mystery of his will. You got it? That's what the first section is about. And uh, <clears throat> we're dealing here with the purpose of God in this first section, which he purposed in Christ, in accordance to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, and works all things. Get it now. You know who the worker is? It's God. Amen. He's the one that worketh all things after the counsel of God. His own will. God is working everything together. This is why all things work together for, for good to them that love God. And are the called according to his what? Purpose. You know what God's doing in time? He's working all things together in accordance to the counsel of his own will. Amen. You know what that tells me? Suffering has a part. Amen? The sufferings of this present time are here for a reason. Amen? It's been given to you. Did you know it was given to you to suffer for Christ's sake? That was given to you by God. Amen? Come on, guys. Get with me now. And so, and so what I know about this first section is that Paul was teaching here about the purpose of God, which he's purposed in himself, and how he's working all things together after the counsel of this own will. And at the heart, at the very heart of this first section, the very heart passage of this is verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. You, you, now guys, listen, I'm going to show you some stuff in this first chapter if you ain't been staring at the boob tube all week, it ought to it it bless your heart this morning. But if you've sat and stared at half-naked women and, and everything else this week, it probably ain't going to do too much for you. I'll just be honest with you. You sit and fill that mind up with carnality and fleshly things, don't expect to come here and be able to enjoy spiritual things. But if you're, if you're ready this morning, I'm going to show you some beautiful things in Ephesians 1. The first section, if you begin from verse 1 down to verse 14, there's 14 verses there in the middle verses, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That's the heart of God's eternal purpose right there. That's the heart. Look at the last verse. 
Verse 14, the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, isn't that, I mean, listen, guys. Let me tell you what you just read. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he was buying something. Mm -hmm. He took his blood and laid the price down. Amen? You were bought with a price. Yes, sir. And Jesus Christ laid, that, laid down his own life and shed his own blood to purchase us for something God purposed in himself before the world even began. Amen. Amen. And now God has made it known to us. And there's coming a time in which Jesus Christ is going to come and gather what he purchased with his blood. And I feel sorry for you, man, if it happens today, if it happens tomorrow, if Christ comes and redeems what he purchased with his blood and you never understood what it was about, I feel sorry for you. But you can't get mad at me and you can't get mad at mommy and daddy. You can't get mad at anybody. It's been in print all this time. Right? But some pe people, read, people read Ephesians, first 14 verses of Ephesians. Man, I'm telling you, they don't, they don't realize the treasures of what's in, that, in them passages right there. They really don't. And so, and so we're going to look at some things this morning, guys. And I promise you, it'll bless your heart if you want it to bless your heart. The purpose... This purpose that Paul lays out here in Ephesians is the reason for our redemption. The very, cause God, listen right here, look right here, you see this cross? It's Ephesians 1, 7. That cross right there, the reason that Christ came and died on that cross, one of the reasons he came and died on this cross is because of something that God purposed in himself before the world began. You need to understand it. Because you were bought with that blood for that purpose. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Not only is it the reason for this redemption through his blood. But up here, whatever, whenever you were saved, God called you by this gospel right here. Yes, sir. And the reason he called you by this gospel. He, when, when Christ paid the price back here, God called you in time by this gospel, and sealed you in Christ to that eternal purpose right there. Guys, there's, it's coming, man. You ain't getting out of it. Just, it's coming. It's real. I have that earnest in my heart. I have it. I have the first fruits of the Spirit. I have the earnest expectation, Bill. And it's coming, man. There's a day coming in which Jesus Christ is going to come and gather out of this world every man that he purchased with his blood and called by the gospel. Amen. And we're going up there for this purpose right here. You getting it? Look at 2 Timothy 1.9. The reason for our redemption and calling by the gospel. 2 Timothy 1.9, what a passage. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Y'all know what a holy calling is? It's when you've been called to fulfill a purpose for God. That's a holy calling. Amen. Anything that's been set apart for God's purpose is holy. Well, you have a holy calling. But God didn't give you this holy calling according to your works. He gave you this holy calling according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before, before the world began. Amen. Now, do you understand your calling now? I heard the gospel up here, Bill. Way, way up here, long after Christ died. And when I heard that gospel and I trusted in that, in Jesus Christ, upon hearing the gospel of my salvation... God sealed me in his son. In his son. He sealed me there 
unto the day of redemption of the purchased possession right there. Christ bought me here, called here, sealed unto the day that he comes and claims what he purchased. And you know why he's coming to get us? For us to fulfill a purpose that God gave us in him before the foundation of the world. You have a holy calling. Amen. Your, your, your calling by the gospel was so that you, this, this holy calling here, we were called by the gospel to fulfill a purpose that God ordained all the way back there. You say, what is it? We're, we're, we're going we're to get to it. We're going to get to it. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful calling, guys. It's a beautiful calling. Right? This purpose was given to us. When was it given to us? Before the world began. Right here. When was it made manifest? Look at, look at 2 Timothy 1.10, but now it was made manifest. It was given to us back here. But now it's made manifest. Right? Do y'all believe that? So that means anywhere prior to it being made manifest, you can't find the purpose God gave you in Christ before the world began. That tells me you're not Israel. That tells me you haven't been called to be priests. It tells me that we had a purpose given to us in Christ before the world began and it was kept hid in God who created all things. This purpose that he gave us in Christ and then he created all things and he kept our purpose in Christ hid and now has made it manifest. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will and this mystery of his will is our holy calling according to God giving us a purpose in Christ before the world began. And when you go up here in the rapture, you're going up there for this purpose God gave you in Christ. Sure. I hope you understand that. I hope you, I'm trying to explain it as easy as I can. All right, now look here in, uh, I mean, guys, I can't help it, man. This stuff, I, I sat down in my study last night, and I've, I've had, a, I had a rough one. I sat down there in my study last night, man, and I started studying this stuff, and when I truly consider that, that God saved and called me, saved me and called me for this holy calling that he gave me in Jesus Christ before the world began. Man, truly consider a verse like that. God saved you not so you could go to heaven. That's as far, that's as, far as some simpletons are going to make it in this world. He didn't just save you guys. He called you to fulfill a purpose that he planned and purposed in himself before the world began. Predestinating you to adoption as his sons and his heirs. You know what it does for me? It makes me want to get rid of every spot and every filthy thing and every vile thing in me so that I can be what God has called me to be in His Son. When you are truly educated in this, you know what you've been taught? To put off the old man. A man that hasn't been taught that don't understand a thing we're talking about this morning. That's right. yeah. there you go, preacher. Paul said, Paul said this, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. You Gentiles that's been called out of the world into this eternal purpose, he says you quit walking like them other Gentiles. In the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. As the truth is in what? 
Well, what's the truth in Christ? What's the truth in Jesus that you put off? The former, concerning the former conversation, the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on this new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We're not talking about a better Paul. We're not talking about a reformed Bill Keener or a new Gary Sedera. We're talking about putting them bums off and putting on Jesus Christ. We're talking about taking Paul Lucas and putting him off. The new man's already created, guys. All you have to do is put him on. It's all you got to do. Amen? And when you get educated in this, guys, the more, you, the more enlightened you become to this, the more you are going to cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, and the more you're going to want Christ in that inner man. Amen? Because this hope out here, this hope of glory, is Christ in you. Amen. Now, they didn't teach you that. They thought you was going to judgment seat of Christ, give an account for your works. Oh, yeah. 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 They thought you was going to be glorified for what you did. The glory that's going to be revealed in you is Jesus Christ and nothing else. Amen. Oh, preacher, I don't like it. Oh, well, deal with it. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Listen, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't jumping on any of you. Man, I got my problems too. All I'm simply saying is the more I understand this, the more I want, I want to just rip this old man off of me. Amen. I don't want Paul Lucas. I don't want him. Right there is where he belongs. I want to know. You want to know what I want to know today? I want to know this right here. I want to know the new man that's risen from the dead, seated at God's right hand. That's what I want to know. I want to take on his full identity, Bill. I want to think like he thinks, love like he loves, know what he knows, understand what he understands, suffer the way he suffers. You say, you crazy preacher? No, I'm not. I want to know the fellowship of that man's sufferings. I want to know them. Because I promise you this, you can't, you can't partake in his glory without knowing them. I know that. Paul knew that. And I don't care what grace church out there don't agree with it. They're going to have to take it up with New Testament doctrine. You cannot know the glory of the Lord without partaking in his present sufferings. Because the same Christ that glorifies you is the same Christ that you're partaking in the present sufferings with. And if you ain't partaking in the sufferings, it's because you ain't got enough Christ in you to partake in those sufferings. You don't know enough about him. There you go. Amen. Amen. Let me get going here, guys. I'm sorry. Look at Colossians 1.9. This purpose that we were given in Christ before the world began. Look at Paul's prayer, Colossians 1.9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Did he make it known or didn't he? Look at it right here. Paul wants you filled with the knowledge of this. This mystery of his will. In. Doesn't just want you filled with the knowledge of it. He wants you filled with that knowledge in all spiritual wisdom and under, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know what that means? God, Paul, Paul's not just praying for you to know this. Paul's also wanting you to have wisdom and understanding of how to walk and respond to this knowledge. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That ye might walk. Walk worthy of the Lord. Unto all pleasing. Guys we've been called. To be something pleasing unto the Father. And I'm sorry man. These grace, grace people running around today. Acting like sin's irrelevant under grace. Need to grow up. 
because it's not. When Paul starts teaching you about living under grace in Romans 6, you know how many times he mentions the word sin or sins from 6.1 to 7.6? 19 times. Don't tell me sin is irrelevant under grace because it's not. You cannot live under the Father and walk in the newness of life that he wants you to walk in if you're obeying sin. You're dead to God. When you serve sin, you are dead to God. You're not living under him. And we all got it. We all got it. But this excuse that under grace, it's okay for me to let it rain and obey it in its lust. That's somebody who's got corrupt thinking about being under the grace of God. It's exactly what it is, brother. I heard you back there. Justification, sanctification. It's exactly what it is. I am now under the legal dominion of the grace of God. It's raining. God's grace is raining through that man's obedience right there. I'm under that grace. There ain't a thing that's ever going to change me from being under the grace of God because it ain't raining by my righteousness. It's raining through his righteousness. It's already established. But here's what Paul wants you to understand in Romans 6. What then? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He says, God forbid. You ought to know better. That to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. <coughs> sin is an issue of you living unto God today. You are putting his son to walk in this newness of life and be made something that's alive unto him for this calling that he's given us in Christ. So that we can serve righteousness and bring forth fruit unto holiness and everlasting life out here. And when you serve sin, you ain't bringing forth fruit unto everlasting life. The end of those things are death. Under grace, under grace. Amen? Oh, Paul said, I want you filled. Look at Colossians 2. Yeah, we're getting worked up up here this morning, Aurora. I think she'd come up here to check on me, make sure that's all right. Colossians 2, 2. That their hearts might be comforted, me knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. The full assurance of understanding. Two. Paul's talking about some riches here. And he's talking about the, the riches of the full assurance of understanding. See, when you come to this full understanding of this stuff, and when we're talking about these riches, look at two, look at two three. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Man, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it something? That we've been given access to all the treasures. Remember back in Romans 9, after Paul just talked about a little bit of dispensational doctrine there in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and he comes to the end of it and he says, Oh, the depth. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways and his judgments past finding out. For who hath been his counselor? Who hath known the mind of the Lord? And now here he's telling us, remember those, remember those depths of those unsearchable riches of wisdom and knowledge that are in God? Paul now says that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and we, we have access to it. And what, Paul, what Paul's talking about here as a believer, what he wants the Colossian believers to come to is an acknowledgement. You know what acknowledgement is? We talk about this stuff here all the time. See that word knowledge there? You know what that is? It's just simply to accept the knowledge that's been given to you. Amen? And Christians sit down here and butt their heads against this stuff. Man, and I don't know why. I don't understand it. God wants us to come to these riches of this full assurance of understanding to this acknowledgement of the mystery of God, the Father, 
and Christ. And we looked, I think we've looked at this last week. This mystery of God concerns creation. Roman or Revelation 10, 7 says when that seventh angel begins to sound, the mystery of God is going to be finished. Revelation eleven fifteen tells you what that mystery of God is. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. The mystery of God concerns the purpose for which He created all things. Amen? They were created by Christ and for Christ. Amen? God has a plan for creation in the fullness of times. You're going to learn about it in Ephesians 1. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Well, what's the mystery of the Father? The mystery of the Father concerns what Jesus Christ went up here to sit down at his right hand to do. Amen? The mystery of God concerns his creation, the creature. The mystery of the Father concerns His Son. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. Christ is now seated at God's right hand as His heir to bring about this purpose that God purposed for the creation. What's the mystery of Christ? It's you seated up here with Him. Paul said in Ephesians 3, he said, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which in other ages was not made. Or he says down there, he says, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You know what the mystery is? You know what the mystery of Christ is? That God took Jews and Gentiles in this dispensation right here, quickened them and raised them and seated them up here in the heavenly places with his son, Jesus Christ. And when he set Christ up there at his right hand, not only did he make him the head of heaven and earth or the, or the heir of heaven and earth, he made him the head of a new creature. And when you got called down here by the gospel, you were baptized and sealed in the body of Christ as a member. And the, head of, and the head of that body and all of its members equal his fullness. This is what you're learning about in Ephesians 1. Meaning when you go up here, you're going up there for this purpose right here. As an heir and a joint heir and a son of God. To bring it to, to function as the body of Christ and bringing about the mystery of the Father and the mystery of God concerning His creation. We've looked at this, man. This is why this creature right here, this is why this creature is waiting for the manifestation of this. Paul said, The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature itself was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. For the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know what the hope of the creation is? The hope of the creation is the day that the glory of that body right there is revealed. You getting it? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Amen. And admired in all them that believe. We've been called, Bill, to manifest the glory of God to the creature down here. And that day when that glory is revealed to this creature, this creature is going to be delivered from its bondage into the glorious liberty of God's children. What are you, what are you going to have to reveal? Paul said, Now are you blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ? 
Paul said, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on the things of the earth for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. But that's predicated upon you seeking those things. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Look here at Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to have to shut up here in a second. This mystery of Christ is where we come in to this purpose of God. We were predestinated to adoption. You know, we get up and we talk about adoption of sons. And people's like, oh yeah, we believe in it, but we don't agree with the... Okay. You know why Christ died on the cross? To redeem children that were under the law. That they might receive the adoption of sons. One of the foundational reasons he died on that cross was to make us adopted adult sons in God's house. And you know the mark of a son? I'm telling you right now, the mark of a son. I'm a father, Bill. I've been a father now for at least 19 years. You know, you, know, you know what I've learned? I love more than anything about being a father. And what I want for my sons more than anything is for them to know my heart and mind. I have no greater joy. And I know the Father in heaven who predestinated me, predestinated me to adoption has no greater joy than for me to know his heart and mind. That proverb over there, David Morgan quotes this verse all the time. He that bringeth up his servant delicately shall have him become a son at length. Amen. A man that brings up his servant right, listen, man, it ain't about blood. You can be a child and not a son. Yep. Amen? Amen? A man can take a servant and make him more of a son than one of his own children. There's two things required in order to become a son. You got to want to know the mind of God. If I got a home there, I've heard this taught like this, man. If I got a home and I got 10 children in it, and Bill, I've got this big inheritance. I've been building, my daddy built it, and my grandfather built it, and then my dad built it, and then I came along and it was given over to me, and I ran it for 60 years, and now I got 10 children, and I say, who's going to be my heir? And I look at those 10 kids, and not a single one of them has any interest in my mind, learning what my father taught me and what his father taught me, and I got 10 children. None of them want to know my mind or how to understand and. and Develop any kind of understanding of how, how to run the family business. And then I look in that house and I got a servant over here. That loves that house as much as I love that house. And wants to know my mind and my heart more than my own children. You know what I'm going to do? They'll always be my children. That servant's going to become my son. Amen? Amen? It's up to you. It's up to you. This is the calling. This is the calling right here. Amen? We were predestinated to adoption. It's at the very heart of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's to take us dead sinners and make us sons. And there have been people say 40, 50 years that know nothing more about the mind of God. And they run around, I'm under grace, I'm under grace, I'm under grace. Are you? Because grace means you're freely receiving some things. Amen. Come on, folks, don't draw back. I ain't being mean to any of y'all. You know what I'm talking about this morning. We need to grow up in Christ. Adoption is why we were redeemed. Adoption is why we were saved. And God adopted us 
for this purpose that he had for us in Christ before the world began. He joined us up here to this new man being created in heaven for the day that he's going to reveal the glory of his son in that body. Amen. I want to, man, I want to, I want to grow up in it. I want to know the mind of God so that I can walk worthy of this calling. Paul wouldn't tell you to walk worthy, man, if it wasn't possible. You can walk worthy of it by simply just growing up into Christ in all things. But you got to love him more than you love that old man. Amen. Let me show you a few things. I'm closing. This first section here in Ephesians. I'm just going to, I ain't even going to draw it up here because we'll talk about this more next week. The central part of this is this cross and the conclusion of it is the redemption of the purchased possession here. Now, every verse before Ephesians 1, 7 deals with what God purposed in himself back here. Every verse after it is what God has made known to us and then we're going up so this is a, the structure of this is beautiful, and we'll see it more next week when I'm actually able to draw this outline out. But here's what I want you to get right now. There's the center of it. The center of God's eternal purpose was Jesus Christ dying on that cross. You need to ask yourself, why was I so important that Jesus Christ purchased me with blood? Who was I? And you know what I've learned? That what brought this to be, what brought Christ into this world, was something God purposed and chose to do before Genesis 1-1. Guys, it's free by grace. What can I do to earn something God already determined he was going to freely give me before the foundation of the world? Amen? Amen. Now, when you, when you start looking at these things, we'll say A, we'll just do this real quick. A, B, C, D, E. Verse 3, you got, ver you got four verses there before the cross, and then you got verses 7 or verses 8 through 12 after the cross, and they go together. Look at verse 3 and verse 8 and 9. Verse 3 says that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Right? Look at verse 8 and 9. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. Verse 8 says, God hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. In other words, you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ in accordance to this mystery of God's will. What God has freely given you in his son up here in the heavenly places, he gave you in accordance to the mystery of his will that he's now made known. What you have in heavenly places is for the purpose of fulfilling the purpose God gave us in Jesus Christ. Now we're waiting. We're waiting for that redemption. Amen? But you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places according to the mystery of God's will that he has now made manifest to us. Look at verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you see that? Before the foundation of the world. Now look at verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of what? <coughs> See what the cross is about? Before the foundation of the world, God chose us. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in accordance to the mystery of God's will that he's now made known. 
These blessings were according to God choosing us in him before the foundation of the world. And the mystery of his will concerns the dispensation of the fullness of times and everything in heaven and earth. In other words, guys, you were chosen before the foundation of the world and then God created all things. What came first? The dispensation of the fullness of times deals with everything God created in heaven and earth. Your choosing in Christ is in accordance to what he purposed for heaven and earth. He chose you to be his heirs and join heirs with his son before the world even began. If you don't believe it, read the next verse, 1-5. Having predestinated us to the adoption of children. Right? See how, see how these go together? Verse 3 and verse 8 and 9 go together. We're talking about the verses before verse 7 and after verse 7. Verse 7 is the heart in whom we have redemption. But what, it's, what is it about? This redemption here. So verse 3, blessed with all spiritual blessings is for the mystery of God's will. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world for the purpose God purposed. For the heavens and the earth in the dispensation of the fullness of times, I was predestinated. Back here, we were predestinated to the adoption of children. And then verse 11, look at it. In whom also we've obtained what? An inheritance being what? Predestinated according to what? The purpose of him. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now look at verse 6 and verse 12. They go together. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Look at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of what? His glory. Look at verse 13. In whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. To the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the praise of his what? Glory. Under the praise of his what? So back here, everything God ordained was to the praise of his glory. And now we, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. Notice that second section there. And we're going to look at this. There's three sentences there in those verses. The, first, the, the, the second sentence begins in verse 7, in whom we have redemption. And then in verse 11, he says, in whom we've obtained an inheritance. We were chosen in Christ to the praise of God's glory. We obtained an inheritance in Christ to the praise that we should be to the praise of His glory. And one day Jesus Christ is coming to redeem what He purchased with His blood unto the praise of the glory of God who ordained these things before the world began. Wow. Guys, we're just getting started in Ephesians 1. How many of y'all knew there was that much in 14 verses? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The Word of God is such a... It's not, it's not just His Word, man. That book is a literary masterpiece. It is the greatest structured book that's ever been put on this earth. Amen. It's outlines, it structures, the way it progresses and unfolds. I mean, the, the book of Ephesians is, a, is an absolute masterpiece. And when I, when I lay out this structure next week and this outline... And how this cross points here and points up here. That's the heart of it all. Right? I was purchased by God's son, Bill. What a thing. What a thing. And I just want, man, I just want to know him. I ain't trying to be a good Baptist. I tried that for years. Didn't work out too good. Amen? Amen? I ain't trying to be a, I ain't even trying to be a good mid acts dispensationalist. That's just, that's just another denomination of Christianity. You don't have to, I mean, honest to goodness, I love, I love the position of mid acts dispensationalism. Don't get me wrong. I believe it's the right interpretation of the Bible. But man, I ain't hanging my hat on having the Bible rightly divided. I want to know him. I want to know him. 
I want to know the man that's seated at God's right hand. And I want to grow up into him in all things. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Any questions before I close? Hope you got something out of this, guys. I hope it's... Man, it's, it's great stuff. It really is. It's, it's worked wonders in my mind. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the precious blood of our Savior. God, just help us to understand each and every day. Help me to understand each and every day that when I open up my eyes, God, I'm, I'm an old fleshly man and an, an old carnal man at times, Father, that, that needs, uh, needs to have his mind stirred and to bring these things to my remembrance. But, Father, I pray each and every day that I wake up, that I would remember the, with the thirst, first thought of my day that I'm, I'm a purchased possession purchased by the blood of your son for your eternal purpose. And God, I just pray that that would always be in the top of all of our hearts and minds that we may strive and, 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 and seek to know your son, Lord, and to begin to walk worthy of you and to, and to just, just, just be people that are pleasing unto you for the purpose you've called us for. And God, I, I just pray for, for those that couldn't be here this morning, Lord, traveling and all that, I pray that you'd be with them, be with me as I travel this week, Father. And God, I just pray that you would uh, 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 edify your body at the conference next week, Lord, and, and, and be with Brother Corn and Brother Gary as they teach here next week, Lord. Give them, give them, give them hearts to, to know and to understand your words so that they can speak and edify the body that's here in this local church. And we just ask it all in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.